the daughter of complaining, divisiveness, backbiting, petty politics, whatever it might be. We should be concerned about how we are perceived by our brothers and our sisters in Christ in terms of our commitment to advance in God's kingdom. So Barnabas received the name the son of encouragement because he was a source of encouragement to people in the church. We encourage people when we give. The second time we see Barnabas is in Acts chapter 9. The church is growing. It is growing not uh, through addition, but it's growing exponentially through multiplication. A lot of people come into faith in Christ. And by Acts chapter 9, the entire city of Jerusalem and much of the nation of Israel was already filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was in spite of the Jewish Christians. So we think of the Jewish Christians as being pious, stained glass saints, they were not. They were religious zealots. They were religious bigots. They thought they were the self-righteous Jews, the heirs of God's kingdom, and they thought that the new expression of the kingdom of God, which wasn't even called Christianity yet, it was still being called, they were called the people of the way, or they were called the followers or the disciples of Jesus. They haven't gotten the name Christians yet, and even the Roman government really thought that this new group was just a branch of Judaism. And the Jews thought that they were more of a branch of Judaism who were referred to today as Messianic Jews, the Jews that believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But the Jews were bigots, they were racist, and they didn't think anybody could come to faith in Christ but Jews. And as a matter of fact, they weren't even trying to preach to the Gentiles. They weren't even trying to preach to the Samaritan. They would only share the gospel with fellow Jews, those of the same ethnicity. And it got so bad until God, through his divine providence, brought persecution on the church at Jerusalem to force them to have to leave to Jerusalem. And as they're leaving Jerusalem, they were intentionally only preaching to Jews but the gospel cannot be contained. And some non-Jews were hearing the gospel, and we see in Acts chapter 10, officially, God sends the apostle Peter to go to a Gentile by the name of Cornelius, and the gospel is preached with intentionality to the Gentiles, and Peter was reluctant. He said, they are unclean. And until God convinced him, what I call clean, don't you call unclean, and Peter goes and preached, and then the Gentiles, for the first time, officially hear the gospel, and are brought into the fellowship of the church, and then later the Samaritans. But the chief bigot in all of Israel was a man by the name of Saul of Tarshish. And there's no bigotry, there's no racism like religious bigotry, religious racism, when you think you're right and you think you're righteous. And so Saul of Tarsus thought that everybody was wrong who didn't believe what Orthodox Judaism taught. So he had made it his preeminent goal and ambition in life to crush the Jesus followers, to destroy the Jesus movement because he thought it was a perversion of Judaism he thought it was heresy, so his goal in life was to destroy Christians, to destroy Jude, uh, Judea, uh, Christianity and this new movement, and he started off by organizing opposition to one of the most powerful preachers of the church, a man by the name of Stephen, and he convinced the religious leaders to stone Stephen to death, and he stood there and gave his consent while Stephen was being stoned. So now in Acts chapter 9, he's on his way to Damascus with warrants, in his saddlebags to arrest Christians in Damascus, bring them back to Jerusalem and have them tried, convicted, beaten, and maybe even executed. Paul was a man of bloodshed. And so on his way to Damascus, you know the story. This bright light from heaven shines, it blinds him, it knocks him off of the beast that he's riding, and now he is wallowing around in the dust, and the voice from heaven cries out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's response was, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gold, against the prick, against the sharp, pointed instrument. And Saul immediately said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He was religious, but he was wrong. He was sincere. He was sincerely wrong. 
And that's why it's important as we as the church, we can be sincere and we can be zealous and we can be religious, but we got to make sure that we are tempered by the Holy Spirit, that what we believe is anchored in what the Bible actually teaches, not in our own prejudice or our customs and traditions that have been passed down to us, because we can be zealously wrong and we can do a tremendous amount of damage. We can greatly disfigure the faith, thinking we are defending the faith. And so even with individuals and issues where we got great, great passion, whether it's we're opposed to same-sex marriage, where we're opposed to the gay and lesbian lifestyle, we got to be careful how we articulate our views. We got to be very careful that we show respect for individuals and people because they are created in the image of God just as much as we are, and except by the grace of God, we could be trapped in the same situation or circumstance that they are in. We must be very, very, very careful. Very careful as to how we respond to social issues when we disagree with people to make sure we're doing it in a way that accurately represents Jesus Christ. So Saul missed the whole point. So now in his blindness, he's led to a man by the name of Ananias. And Ananias meets him on a street called Straight, and he prays for Saul. And Saul has his sight restored as the scales falls from his eyes. And the Lord then gives him instruction as to what he's going to do. He's going to be a witness. He's going to preach to Gentiles and kings and powerful rulers, but he's going to suffer great persecution. Great persecution. And so Saul there is at Damascus, and he's preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And the Jews in Damascus get wind that Saul is a turncoat. He has betrayed Judaism, the very thing that he was trying to destroy. Now he's exalted and lifted up. So the Jews at Damascus, they conspired to assassinate him. Now Saul has the Jews who wanted to assassinate him. So the Damascus Christians put him in a basket, lowered him down over the wall so he could escape with his life out of Damascus. He then heads back to Jerusalem. But before he gets to Jerusalem, the word has already gotten to Jerusalem to the Jewish leaders that Saul has abandoned Judaism and he's embraced this following of Jesus. So now there's a contract out on his head in Jerusalem for his death. He goes to the church, but they won't let him in because they think it's a trick. They think he's coming in as a spy. He's pretending to have come to faith in Christ, but he's actually coming in to wreak havoc and destroy the church. So he's ostracized and he's excommunicated from Judaism and he's not allowed access to the church. He's a man in spiritual limbo who don't have a spiritual home who does not have a spiritual church, so what in the world is he going to do? And nobody, nobody will go to bat for him among the apostles because they don't trust him and they're trying to save their next to Peter, James, John, Matthew, Bartholomew. None of them will speak on his behalf. They say, no, don't let him in. Don't let him come to the fellowship and don't have anything to do with him. But the Bible says a man by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas goes to Damascus, he interviews people in Damascus, he wants to know, did he really make a profession of faith in Christ, and was he really preaching publicly that Jesus is the Christ? And the disciples of Damascus says, absolutely, so much so, with so much power, and so much irresistibility, that the Jews here wanted to kill him. So Barnabas then goes back to Jerusalem, and he goes to the apostles, and he speaks up on Paul's behalf. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 9, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, and they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he is with them at Jerusalem, coming in and out and going, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him, him out to Tarsus. This is the incredible narrative. This is a man that's going to write most of the New Testament record, but basically has been rejected for the most part by the church until Barnabas comes and sponsors him in to the church. We encourage people when we stand up for them. Barnabas stands up for Saul of Tarsus. He stands up for him. 
he advocates on his behalf to the church. They accept him in. So now Paul is accepted into the church at Jerusalem. He now has a church home. He now has a fellowship, a place where he can connect with. And Paul is now living out his faith, preaching and teaching. And you see the Hellenists. The Hellenists are the Greek speaking Jews, they were the true intellectuals because they not, knew not only the, the Roman tongue of Latin, but they knew the Greek term and the old tongue and they also knew the Hebrew tongue and they also knew the other tongue that was spoken. So Paul now, is this, he is primarily qualified for this position because of his training as a theologian, as a lawyer, and as a preeminent intellectual. And so he's arguing and he's debating with the Hellenists. And he's so powerful, his argument is so irresistible, the word spreads, he is legitimate and we can't do anything with him because his theological and spiritual logic is so tight. So what they do? They conspire to kill him. They conspire to kill him. And very often in any society, in any culture, the goal is to silence the thought leaders who stand outside of the status quo. I don't care where it is, whether it's spiritual in the context of, of the church or spiritual things, whether it's social, those who are thought leaders who dare to speak the truth to power regardless of the situation will often be ostracized and attempt to marginalize them. And if it gets bad enough, they'll want to kill them. So now Paul has nowhere to go. So what they do, they put him on the first ship headed to Tarsus. They were sending him literally home. There was nowhere he could go but home. The safest place he could go to was back home in Tarsus, and at least he would have the safety of his own neighborhood and his own community. But Barnabas believes in it. Now, in the Bible, there are these short gaps where they don't give you the timeline, but during this period of time, at least 14 years passed, and there's no word about Saul of Tarsus. 14 years passed. You pick that narrative up in the book of Galatians when the argument was raised regarding Paul's apostleship, the legitimacy of it, where his credentials were authentic because he was not selected during Jesus' earthly ministry. So Paul makes his argument in Galatians 1 and 2 saying, no, I was chosen by Jesus Christ and I spent 14 years in the Arabian desert and I was taught by divine revelation. So Paul says my apostleship is not inferior, it is equal to the apostleship of Peter, James, and John. 14 years passed, and there's no word from the Apostle Paul or his ministry. In the meantime, the Holy Spirit is moving the church, and the church is moving in the Gentiles' communities, and the church is established in a place called Antioch. And the church in Antioch becomes the most powerful church of that era, the most powerful church of that era, because it was a church of Jews and Greeks and Africans and Medes and Persians. It was this eclectic, diverse church, like nothing that Jerusalem could even imagine or had even thought about. So you pick up the narrative in chapter 11. In chapter 11, and this is really kind of interesting. Uh, when, the, when the church and Jerusalem heard about this. They said, this is some type of dysfunctional, heretical, and nowhere in the world God could be in this, this cosmopolitan, this, this stew of people coming together. How in the world can they have any theological, doctrinal clarity when they're coming from all these different uh, ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds and differences? So the church at Jerusalem pretty much wrote this thing off as being some irrelevant thing that had been created. Look at verse 19 of Acts 11. Now those who were scattered from the persecution of the roads over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and great, great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Peter, James, and John said, look, we're not even going to deal with this. So they sent Barnabas. 
You see, what in the world is going on at Antioch? Barnabas arrives at Antioch, the text says, in verse 23, and when Barnabas comes, he does not see spiritual confusion. He does not see spiritual chaos. He does not see a heretical situation. When Barnabas sees all these different people from Phoenicia and Cyprus and Cyrene and the Hellas and the Africans, he sees all of them worshiping together. The Bible says Barnabas saw the grace of God. Verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with one purpose of heart, that they should continue with the Lord. We encourage people when we see the grace of God upon their lives and in their ministry, and we affirm them by saying, I see that God is blessing you in ways that you might not even see. So rather than coming and criticizing them and telling them how they should be singing songs and how the order of service should be organized, he let them figure it all out in their cultural context in terms of what fit them best, but he saw that they had the main thing was the main thing, and that was to lift up the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to call people to repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. He could see that God, Holy Spirit was at work, and the Bible says he was glad. How glad do you get when somebody else gets blessed? You know, until here recently, you know, I haven't driven very good automobiles over the years. I always give my wife the best car we had. When the kids started driving, they'd have the next best car. And I would just have anything that would start every now and then. It never bothered me one bit. It doesn't bother me to this day. I mean, I've never been that way about automobiles. I've never loved but one car. And I love that 1972 uh, Plymouth Duster that my mama bought me. I love that car. But after I got over that and they made me get rid of that one, I said, I ain't going to love no more automobiles. So every time I would see somebody get a brand new car, I was glad, particularly if I knew them. If they got a new car, it's running all the time. The more new cars my friend get, it increased the probability when I break down, one of them will go be coming that way. And they're going to be able to rescue me from the roadside. So I was glad. And we ought to be glad when God does things in the lives of other people, particularly the people that we know. And we ought to rejoice with them. We ought to rejoice when we see God blessing their children, graduating from college, graduating from graduate school, doing great things. We ought to rejoice if they buy a new house. Rejoice if they get a new car. Rejoice if they get a new change of clothing. Don't find something wrong with them. Tell them how good they look. And just rejoice and be glad because we encourage people. We encourage people when we are happy and glad and we can rejoice with them when God is blessing. So the Bible says Barnabas saw the grace of God and he was glad and he encouraged them. A couple more things and I'll be through. The other thing is this here. This, I, Barnabas is an incredible individual because he was so gifted and he was so beloved by the church and that could have led him to kind of overstep his boundaries of giftedness and try to do something God really hadn't gifted him to do. So this big church at Antioch is coming together. They obviously need leadership. He's the one who's affirmed them and encouraged them. They love him dearly, and he could have automatically volunteered his services for that church. But when Barnabas looked at that situation, he says, I'm not really the most qualified person for this situation. I don't have the training to be a cosmopolitan person. I wasn't trained in the deep theology of, of Judaism. I don't know the connection between Judaism and the Christian faith, and I've been called to have this type of ministry. So the Bible says the first thing Barnabas does, he catches the first ship he can get on, and he heads to Tarsus. Fourteen years later, he goes to Tarsus, and he says, this is a job for Saul. God has called him, and God has gifted him, and he has the package of gifts to manage this situation. So Barnabas gets Saul's of Tarsus. He brings Saul's back to Antioch. And this is when Saul begins his ministry. Without Barnabas, he doesn't get accepted by the Jerusalem church. Without Barnabas, he never gets connected to Antioch. Without Barnabas, he doesn't have a worldwide ministry. We encourage people when we recognize their giftedness. When we recognize their giftedness and we do what we can do to elevate them, to help them feel, fulfill their full potential in their area of giftedness as they're trying to advance the kingdom of God. So he brings Saul to Antioch. And man, it's kind of incredible. Once Saul shows up, 
this guy, brilliant. He's a lawyer. He's a theologian. He's an educator. He's trained. He didn't spend 14 years being taught by Jesus. He has all kinds of stuff inside of him and itching for the right environment to be used by God. So he comes back, and it's literally incredible what happens at Antioch. If you read those chapters 11 and 12 over in chapter 13, you find that the church at Antioch recognized that the gospel is not just for us, you got to go to the world. So the gospel goes to the world, not from Jerusalem. It goes from Antioch. It goes from Antioch. Paul was a member of the church at Antioch. And so the church at Antioch says, we believe that God has called you to take the gospel to the world. They prayed for Paul and Barnabas, and they got little John Mark, and they prayed for them and anointed them, and they sent them on this worldwide mission. And so then Paul and Barnabas, they started to travel to all these different places, to Pamphylia, to Thessalonica, to all these different places. They're going and taking the gospel. In some places, a lot of people are getting saved. Other places, they're getting stoned. They're getting ran out of town. And their lives are always in jeopardy. And some days, they, are, they have the... the uh, the good pleasure of having an unsanctified fast imposed upon them. That's simply means they don't have no money, can't buy no food, therefore they cannot eat. So they pray. So in the midst of all of this trouble and difficulty, this young disciple, Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, it's just too hard for him. He's not ready for this type of commitment, this type of peril and danger. So he defects, he goes back home to Jerusalem, to his mom and Barnabas and Saul, who now refers to as Paul, they complete the missionary journey. They come back. They give the report to the church at Antioch, and everybody's excited. The gospel has gone to the world from this little nondiscreet place of Antioch. So in the meantime, the religious bigots, they just haven't gotten over the fact that you mean to tell me God wouldn't wait on us, the church of Jerusalem, God wouldn't wait until we got over all of our racism and prejudice to use us. You mean to tell me that God has taken the gospel to the world without us? That's exactly what God had done, but they were still upset. So what they do, they start trying to discredit Paul. Read Acts chapter 15. They say, he's not an apostle. He don't have no credentials. Who in the world is he? His gospel's not real, and the Gentiles really cannot be saved unless they first convert to Judaism. So the church of Jerusalem was holding to all their traditions and say, no, if a man gets saved, then he has to be circumcised as a grown man. He has to observe the law of Moses. Therefore, his salvation is not authentic. Paul says spiritual nonsense. You read Acts chapter 15, one of the biggest showdowns in the church, maybe the biggest showdown in the church, that Paul and Barnabas, they come to the church at Jerusalem to make their case for the simplicity of the gospel as being faith in Jesus Christ and faith in him alone, apart from the law of Moses, apart from observing the law, and apart from circumcision. And they come and they have, this, this, is, this is a debate of debate. This is the spiritual heavyweights. And they come and make their case. And once they finish making their case, the church at Jerusalem relents and they recognize that God is bigger than their world. And they recognize that Paul has this commission from God and the gospel truly is the gospel that Paul is preaching, not adding Judaism onto it. So what this is all about. You encourage people when you stand up for the truth. You stand up for the truth. What Paul was saying is that the faith of the Gentile world here weighs in the balances. If they feel like that they are inferior to Jewish Christians because they have a secondhand gospel, a watered down part of the gospel. So when Paul went to Jerusalem, he wasn't just standing up for his ministry. He was standing up for the purity of the gospel and he was standing up for the Gentiles to be accepted in the church as full Christians on the same level and plane as those that have been Jews. You encourage people when you stand for the truth. When you stand for the truth and you see this same type of stand in the book of Galatians. When Paul stands for the truth against the apostle Peter. When Peter, who knows the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is for Jews and Gentiles, he knows that the Gentiles do not have to convert to Judaism to become Christians. But when the Jewish Oliak comes from 
Jerusalem and they see that Peter is eating with the Gentiles. Peter kind of slides away from the pig feet and the hog moss and the chillings. They say, I don't really eat that stuff. I'm just sitting over there. And Paul stood him and said, wait a minute, Peter, you're being a hypocrite. Before everybody, he calls out the chief apostle, the apostle Peter. He said, you are being a hypocrite because you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with what we eat. And you know that, and you've been fellowshipping with us. You know that from your experience in Acts chapter 10 when you went and met with Cornelius. You know that God has given the gospel to the Gentiles just like he gave it to the Jews. And now you're playing the hypocrite. And the church was strengthened and encouraged because he stood for the truth. A couple more minutes and I'll be through. We encourage people when we give to meet needs. We encourage them when we stand up for them and believe in. We encourage people when we see the grace of God upon their lives and affirm that. We encourage people when we see their giftedness and encourage them to pursue their area of giftedness for the glory of God. And we encourage people when they see that we're willing to stand up for the truth, even when it's inconvenient. Lastly, we encourage people when we stand up for the underdogs. When we stand up for the underdogs. You, know, you go places and to speak and they want you to send a bow and send a resume and they want to read all of this long stuff, you know, which just doesn't make any sense. They just take away from the amount of time that you're going to speak. And I try to send people, just, just read this little short piece right here. I never forget. I never forget this. The greatest blessing I've ever received in the form of an introduction. I was up Worth Avenue, preaching a little hole in this church up there. I can't remember the name of it. And uh, for the life of me, I believe that I've lost uh, several levels of hearing because in the pulpit, they sit me right beside the speaker. And they don't believe in playing music loud. They believe in playing it as loud as it can be played. And I'm sitting beside this speaker, man, my head is just ringing and my ears, wow, it's just kind of incredible. I don't want to offend anybody, so I sit there and I kind of endure this. And then a young guy from my hometown, he was about the same age as my youngest brother. To this day, I don't know his name. We grew up in the same neighborhood. But in the neighborhood, everybody got a nickname. So his nickname was Nene. That's just what we called him. That's, that's all I knew was Nene. So Nene, he got up to introduce me. And this is what he said. He said, he said, the, the best thing I would say about Reverend Watts is that he always stood for the underdogs. I had no idea he was paying attention to this. He said, we were growing up in the stadium terrace in the project, and we would play sports. And he was always one of the best. I'm not being boastful, but I'm just like Will Sonnet, no brag. I mean, just the facts. I mean, it, it is what it is. And he says he was always one of the best, and so he always one of the captains. He would always be the one choosing. And he said he would always choose us younger players, the little guys. He'd always want the little guys, the youngest guys on his team. And he says when he chose us, he told us we could win. And he said we believed that he could win. we could win because we had him. And we wanted to not disappoint him. And we normally won. Here's what he didn't know. I chose them out of selfish motives. I knew they couldn't play. But I personally wanted to get better. And I knew the only way that I could get better, I had to challenge myself to get better, and I would challenge myself to get better by having people that couldn't play. It mean I had to play harder, and if I played harder, I got better. I got better. And the reason I retired at 25 from playing sport, because I'm not about losing. If I'm going to play, I'm going to try to win. I'm gonna try, that's why they keep the scoreboard. If winning wasn't important, they wouldn't keep the score. They keep the score because winning is really important. And I begin to realize I'm not going to be out here crippled and broke up trying to win some game where you're not getting paid, trying to keep some of these young boys from trying to earn a reputation saying that we beat what? It wasn't going to happen. Two people that walked away from the game, me and Archie Talley. 
We want our legacies to be intact. We left the fastest guns in the West. But when he said that, man, it made me feel good. It made me feel good. We encourage people when we stand up for the underdog. My mom used to always say that. She said, boy, you got to be on the side of the underdog. You got you to side yourself with the underdog. So we encourage people when we side, stand up for the underdog. Now, where do I see this in the Bible? Well, I see it as I close in Acts chapter 15. After this great victory in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Council, when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas caused Peter and James and John in the church of Jerusalem to stand down and recognize that they were wrong about the gospel and that Peter and that Barnabas and Paul were correct, they come back to Antioch. And Paul is restless and he's anxious. He wants to get back on the missionary trail and he wants to go back out and encourage uh, the, the churches and see how the churches were doing because there wasn't no email or fax or Facebook or Twitter or computer. You, you had to go see people. So Paul wants to go back and check on the churches. And Barnabas says, that's a wonderful idea. Let's go back and check on them. Verse 36 Acts 15, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted they should not take the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so great that they departed from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed back home to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed and, and they, the brethren commended him to the grace of God. This is a powerful scene. This is a powerful scene. These two powerful men of God, these co-laborers together, they've worked together for years now. They've been on the evangelistic trail together. They've bonded together. They've had each other's back. They've been beaten and stoned. They've been hungry together. And now they come to this great point of contention. And the contention is, is a young disciple by the name of John Mark, is he worth investing any more time into? He had given, been given a chance on the mission field. He had departed. He had defected from the faith and left and went back home. And now John Barnabas says, well, let's give the young boy another chance. And Paul says no. And Barnabas says, but Saul, he calls him Saul, I believe. Do you remember when you didn't have a church home and I went to bat for you in Damascus and I brought you to Jerusalem and I stood with you there and gave you access to the church of Jerusalem and when you were ostracized back home to Tarsus, I came and found you and brought you to Antioch. I've always been on the side of the underdog. This young man has potential. He, he can make it in the ministry if we give him another chance. But you see the arrogance of the Apostle Paul in this text. You see his insensitivity. He says, no, we're not going to take the one. The greatest way you can insult somebody is not call them by name. We're not going to take the one that departed, that defected, that left us. We're not going to take him. And Barnabas being the man of God that he was, he stood down. All right, Mr. Apostle. It's your show. I'm not going with you. Barnabas stands on his own principle, and his principle is that people are important. And the mean, the ends don't justify the mean. So how you treat people to get somewhere is important. And Paul was wrong right here. He was wrong. God can still bless us even when we're wrong because God's blessing is greater than our personal flaws. But Paul is so consumed by the work, he loses the importance of the people, and that one day he's going to get old and not going to be to do the work. If he hadn't trained some of these young people, the work goes to the grave with him. So you read the text closely, you don't hear anything else from out of Barnabas in the whole Bible. Paul becomes the big show. All the light is on him. He takes Silas. He later picks up Timothy. He later picks up Titus. And there's nothing else mentioned about Barnabas anywhere in the Bible. He goes back home to Cyprus. But that's not the end of the story. The Apostle Paul and Silas, man, they go on a Blix Crete. I mean, this thing is kind of incredible. You read the book of Acts, and what they did is really almost impossible to believe that they could accomplish this with such meager means. Escape death, be shipwrecked, be beaten and left for dead, be beaten with 39 times when 40 stripes were thought to kill a man, and he endured it all. 
when you come to the end of the record in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's an old man now, old in terms of he's only in his 60s, but he's old because his body has, has been broken. He has arthritis and rheumatism and all these ailments. He has Luke traveling with him who is a physician who's trying to treat his conditions. And he's locked up in a Roman prison. He has been tried and convicted and has been sentenced to death by beheading. He don't know when the time is going to come or the hour, but he knows that it may be imminent. And so they tortures him by leaving him in this cell. And so he picks up his pen and he writes this final epistle, his swan song to his chief mentee in the ministry, Timothy. And you read 2 Timothy 4.4 4 and you, 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 you read the words of a man who knows that the night is starting to gather around his head. And you can sense the loneliness. He says, Timothy, he says, I'm all by myself here. Nobody's here but, but Luke. Titus left me because he had something to do. Demas has forsaken me because he loved this present world. I'm all here. I'm by myself. Luke comes to tend to my physical conditions, but I'm lonely now. I left my Bible, I left my parchments on the hairy, so stop and pick up my parchment, get my books and bring them to me, and bring my, my cloak. I left my coat at Troas, and the winters here in Rome are cold. And he says, what have you do, Timothy? Get here before winter. Because winters in Rome, they're, they're cold and they're lonely and they're dreary and discouragement and depression sits here. And he says, oh, by the way, when you come, Stop by and pick up John Mark. He don't say, go get the one, the one who left us at Pamphylia. Now he knows him by name. He's heard about Mark's work. He's heard about how Mark has been restored. He's heard about his ministry. He says, pick up John Mark and bring him to me because he's now profitable for me. He can help me now. He can help me now. And I believe that what Paul really was longing for, he was longing for something that he lost at Antioch more than anything else. He was longing for the fellowship with Barnabas, but Barnabas is gone now, and the closest thing to Barnabas is Mark. And so if I can see Mark just one more time, I'll be reminded of my friend Barnabas who put everything on the line for me, and I never got the time to tell him how much I appreciated it and how grateful that I am. So we encourage people when we stand up for the little guy. We never will know what the little guy is going to become. So Mark becomes a mentee and a disciple of Barnabas. Paul got Timothy and, and, and Titus and Silas and all of these big people. And they were great men of God. Make no mistake about it. They were great men of God. But Titus' name is on the epistle, but he didn't write it. Paul wrote it to Titus. Timothy's name is on two epistles. He didn't write them. Paul wrote them to Timothy. Silas's name is not on any books of the Bible and all them other folk that Paul had. But Mark got a gospel. Mark's name is on a gospel that he penned. So if Barnabas hadn't stood up for the underdog and defended him against the spiritual bully, in this case the apostle Paul, then Mark would have been crushed. And the church would have not had his gospel, which was the first of the gospels to be written. He wrote the first record of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you don't know when you, when you stand up for the little guy, you don't, know, you don't know what the little guys might become. You don't know what the underdogs might become. And you don't know who you will encourage along the way. So we can encourage others by following the Barnabas pr principle. The Barnabas name isn't on a book that we recognize in our canon, right? But his name is all in Mark. His, his, his presence, his influence is all in Mark's gospel. And that's the New Testament way. We give ourselves away by investing ourselves in others, finding some young people to pour ourselves into because we never know what they will embrace and how God will use them to do much greater things than what we ever could imagine. Amen? Amen. So just make up, make up your mind and be an encouragement. Most people know what's wrong with them. They really do. 
But many people are trying to figure out what's right with me. Where has God gifted me? Where can God use me? And they need someone to point that out to them and keep reminding them and keep telling them that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and they're gifted by God. And God has something for them to do. And keep on believing him. And keep on trusting him. And you never can tell what they might accomplish, what they might do. As I prepare to go up here and give this honor in behalf of my brother, he still speaks to me. I never forget. One day, he saw me working some math problems. I was just in the second grade. I always loved numbers, always loved math. And he said, boy, you're a genius. You're a genius. I didn't know what a genius was. But I thought it probably was something good. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it. And I wasn't no genius, and I'm not no genius. But I wanted to work hard in school because he said I was a genius. And so I didn't never want to let him down. And I want to live up to being someone that was serious about school and about academics. Just one word, boy, you are a genius. So we never know what our words, the impact they can have on the lives of young people to inspire them to want to do great things. Amen? I'm way out of my time. I thank you for yours.